I'm going to just do a quick introduction on Brian, then he's going to take us back in time to looking at the trade routes and then how the Dockland route was built and then looking at the big ships, the mail ships, and then the shift containerization. And then he comes up with quite a poignant question at, at the end. Um, Brian, I'm sure you don't need any introduction. Um, many of us are familiar with your work through your brilliant talks, um, but also through your work as a journalist, um, your weekly column, the Cape Times, I, I love the name, um, many of us read, and then there are your, your books as well, which uh, are still available, um, bid or buy, 150 rand, and I'm so chuffed that you're writing another one um, that will be published next year. I uh, can't, can't, can't wait for that. Um, but also your phenomenal work you've done for young people and you continue to do through educating um, at Law Hill, which you helped to set up 27 years ago. Um, some of you may be familiar with Law Hill. It's a school in Simonstown at the top. And um, they are like a high school for kids that are passionate about working for the maritime um, industry and they can earn a huge amount. And they're typically students from really tough backgrounds. Um, and it's fantastic. They celebrated their 25th birthday recently um, and had the celebrations and you can see them online if anybody wants the Zoom links, um, let, let me know. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to Gabby at the Mount Nelson who introduced me to Brian. Um, Brian helped them identify the pictures of ships and could um, from a mile off tell, tell Gabby which one it was. And uh, some of you came to Brian's talk in um, this rather lovely room, the Lord Nelson room here, um, where we, we had a lovely lunch afterwards. Um, so now I'm going to stop sharing and, and hand over to, to Brian. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, those further afield at whatever time of day it is. So uh, welcome. I hope you enjoy the show. And also just please ver feel very free to ask whenever. Uh, we're going to rush through Cape Town's Dockland today. Uh, just a little uh, cautionary, please, that to note that some of these images are subject to copyright regulations. And uh, we have to start with uh, the way it was back then and with the trade routes that developed over many years. Uh, but the basic trade route out from Europe to Asia uh, going this way and following in many cases the northeast trade winds, then picking up the Brazilian current and then the westerly wind and then around here up with the southeast trades and the monsoons and also across here. And then the return trip from say uh, the Indian area uh, was with the monsoons and down with the currents picking up the good old southeast trades going across the Atlantic and then the northeast trades and of course the North Atlantic drift to get back to Europe. Um, that's uh, the sort of scene that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, I remember it very well. I took the picture and there is the old fort before the castle. So this is a very early picture of uh, an East Indiaman at the Cape. Um, and then uh, thanks to Library of Parliament and uh, I see that uh, our good friend is uh, one of the guests today. Uh, but this picture shows the early development of Cape Town and, and of course a few buildings that may still exist today. Um, but that's what it looked like um, in 1854 and you'll see that all there was in the bay were three jetties sticking out like this and wooden jetties. And you can imagine the difficulty that folks had transshipping cargo from vessels anchored in the bay, bringing it ashore to one or other of these jetties. Um, and of course, the swell sometimes was horrific or the wind was horrific and it made life very difficult. But that was the Cape in 1854. And this picture taken uh, 1898 shows uh, a lot of the old part of the harbor that we know today uh, under construction. This is the Alfred Basin here, which was the original harbor. Uh, and just to give you a perspective, 
there's the dry dock. Uh, the waterfront is over in this area here. Uh, Table Bay Hotel is here. Uh, along this uh, wall here is the uh, uh, Cape Grace. Uh, one and only is about here. And this area here, which was the quarry that was dug for stone to make the breakwater and to line some of these jetties, this quarry here uh, has now been flooded and is a marina. It, uh, in the interim, it served as uh, Cape Town's fuel storage depot. And so uh, petrol and diesel and ship's fuel and all were stored in this area. But it's since been changed. And of course, we've got a nice marina for luxury uh, yachts and things. And around it, we now have some very smart flats and uh, apartments and hotels and others. And also just to uh, give you more perspective, there's the clock tower. Um, the board of executives or now called, I think it's the Ned Bank headquarters over here. And then the Victoria Basin is uh, this part here. And this is under construction. We call it South Arm. And uh, it's under construction. And of course, it was semi-enclosed, semi what we know as the Victoria Basin. Um, so that was Cape Town. And just also to show you one of the old mail ships inward from the UK. So that's, uh, that's the Cape round about uh, 1898. And then it grew to this. And of course, here we have Victoria Basin with the Alfred Basin. This was the original harbor. Um, the one and only is along here, uh, beg your pardon, the uh, Cape Grace Hotel is here. Uh, board of Executives here, the um, uh, Siobhan Battery over here, uh, Robin Island Gateway there, uh, the grain, uh, grain elevator over here, and then these boats. Now, just to also put in perspective, this was Cape Town's harbor. Uh, it grew because, of course, uh, we had diamond discoveries, we had gold discoveries, and just the general growth of the country uh, post-1910. So this was the Cape Town Harbour of round about 1920 thereabouts. Um, some of the main berths were over here. The mail ship that used to go weekly to the UK would be berthed here. The one that came in weekly from the UK would be berthed here. Uh, the grain elevators over here. And this uh, once was a coal terminal where coal was offloaded for Cape Town and for ships. Um, and it changed its function to export grain from the grain terminal here. And, but it's retained the name of Collier Jetty. Waterfront development around here, Table Bay Hotel in this area here. Um, and I, I assume, by the way, people can see the cursor moving. You happy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and... Uh, uh, the uh, So Table Bay Hotel is over here, and then the rest of the waterfront has grown around this area. The latest development, the silo uh, area around there. So this was Cape Town Harbour, a busy harbour, and of course it, had, uh, it was too small. Uh, it was built, but of course too small and designed actually before a lot of the cargo started to pass through, and so we still had congestion. Uh, this is what the uh, the place looked like. Uh, just to show you where this particular berth is, uh, it's over here. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting my cursor going. Uh, it's over here, and the one ship is here, the other one is there, and the wagon that's shown is about there. Um, so, uh, um, this is a really old picture of two of the big ships of the time that served South Africa from the UK. And uh, if you look here, you'll see that there are no motorized vehicles at all. It's all horse-drawn cabs and these wagons. And just to give you a bit of perspective, my grandfather ran a business of importing glassware and crockery. And uh, he was quite good at it and did quite well in that he had a little bungalow at Clifton and they lived in Mowbray on a small holding where he had chickens and all sorts of things. And uh, he got his biggest order ever. And that big order included glassware and crockery and all from the UK. 
and he paid for it, and now he awaited its arrival, and presently it came. Now, he had a wagon like the one in the foreground here, um, just getting the cursor moving again, like this wagon here. He had two beautiful Clydesdale horses that pulled it, and he went down to the docks to collect these big crates of the glassware and crockery that came. And uh, as they loaded the first one onto the, on, onto the wagon, he detected a strange noise. He immediately opened it up, and inside everything had been smashed. Uh, the second and third boxes proved to be equally damaged. And that, of course, meant that uh, the poor old chap uh, was uh, out on a limb. Uh, somebody hadn't packed the goods properly, and uh, what made matters worse was that there was no insurance taken, there had been no insurance taken out on it. Uh, not his fault, somebody else had slipped up. Um, and that caused him to have to sell his little house at Clifton, otherwise I might be taking in the sunset every evening. So that was a little story from our lives. This is a vessel coming into the Alfred Basin. And just to show you here on uh, this side is the clock tower. Over here is the pierhead. Uh, it's a, now a gray painted building. And the swing bridge goes across here where the ship has just passed through. And ships like this used to come in there regularly into what we know as the Alfred Basin. Um, so that shows that it did happen. And then we had uh, bigger ships. These were the mail ships of the time, uh, around about 1913, uh, 15 into the 20s, and some of these were even going into the 30s. But this is one of the Union Castle mail ships uh, coming in. You'll note, of course, that there weren't any green people around in those days, so the smoke didn't matter. And uh, I want you just to have a look down here at the stern, where we have the portals of those who were uh, not so well off, and they traveled down here, and some even traveled down there without portals. And uh, just to tell you a little story about my own family, um, my mother, according to pictures of her in her youth, was quite an attractive young lady. And she met a guy called Robbie. And Robbie Inkpen lived in Durban. Um, that uh, had moved to Durban in the interim. Um, but she was in East London. Now, she was uh, the daughter of a widow. Uh, who uh, had lost her husband, a school teacher, early on. And uh, so this old lady had brought up my mother and her brother single-handedly uh, on meager money. So she got a job as a counter jumper in a music store, and uh, she made a few, uh, I suppose, pennies in those days for her task. And uh, then having met Robbie Ingpen, uh, she found out, of course, that he lived in Durban. She lived in East London. So she saved her pennies, and she was going to see her boyfriend up in Durban. But in those days, things were a little bit different. And, uh, of course, there was uh, not the freedom that we do have today. And uh, my grandmother, who her mother, who was a short lady, rather like the Giles cartoon granny, except a thin version, um, and she had a pretty strong personality. And the day and when she before she would allow her daughter to visit her boyfriend in Durban, she had written a very stern letter to boyfriend's parents um, and uh, making sure that there would be a chaperone around to make sure everything went well. Um, they, she got the assurance of uh, good Christian people and all that stuff. And uh, so lo and behold, um, my mother was allowed to visit Robbie. So the day came in East London when the mail ship arrived and down she went. She'd booked one of these uh, berths down here at the stern, um, very little by way of comfort. And off she went to the docks, but Granny insisted on going with. So she boarded with Granny. Um, and of course, Granny was only going to see, the, see her daughter off. She wasn't traveling with her. And when she got on board, they went to the cabin and it was a four berth cabin and the other three occupants were men. So you can imagine the uh, dismay and anger of this very fiery uh, lady, my grandmother. She rushed up to the purser's office and told him how immoral he was of booking her daughter in with men and all that sort of stuff. 
And he said, well, don't worry, ma'am, we'll put it first class. So my mother was then put into a first class cabin. And this is a very poor girl um, sitting in first class comfort. And of course, absolutely delighted that now she had a single berth cabin and a beautiful view um, out to sea. So the ship sailed from East London and it was uh, five o'clock and she just uh, sort of uh, tried out the bed, all very comfortable, and uh, she fell asleep. And she woke up and looked at her watch, it was six o'clock. And as she looked out of the, the window, it was not a porthole, it was a window that she looked through. Uh, as she looked out through the window, there was the bluff of Durban passing. She'd slept the whole night in first class and hadn't had a bite to eat. Uh, so that's our story of Union Castle and first class travel. This is the grain elevator as it was built. When it was built, it was the tallest building in Southern Africa. And it had uh, most concrete ever used in a building in Africa. And uh, so it, it was a huge structure for the time and it still remains a huge structure. And what has happened as you folks know better than I do is that they've extended it upward a bit. They've changed this part into a very fancy hotel and this part has been changed into a very fancy uh, and nice art gallery. So it's all changed of course, but that was built to export grain. Uh, and it did that every season, every grain season, the ships would come to uh, load the grain and take it all over the world. Um, things changed in South Africa and we became a net importer of grain. Uh, there were just too many mouths to feed, both in South Africa and in Southern Africa. And so we became a net importer of grain rather than exporter. And this uh, grain elevator was used for import cargoes. And those cargoes were then stored there until they were railed all over South Africa, all over Southern Africa. Uh, and there's a view of that grain elevator today. You'll see it's been extended and modified and of course, beautified. And some of you may even have been inside there. I haven't, it's a dream. Um, also what's changed in that area, the buildings, there's Alan Gray and a lot of other office blocks. And then the Nelson Mandela gateway to Robben Island here. Um, this is, uh, I mentioned the uh, ships coming in from the UK, and this is a ship coming in in 1935. It's one of the big mail ships of the time. And the gentlemen coming off here are important people because this was the South African cricket team that was returning from a very successful tour of UK, of uh, England rather. And uh, they'd won the series 1-0 against England. Um, largely because four of the matches were rained out and uh, they won the one that uh, was completed. So it was a very successful tour of 1935. But look at the crowd waiting to meet them. And of course, some of those people wouldn't have been bothered about the, uh, the, the cricketers coming in, but they would be worried about their loved ones who are arriving from the UK. Uh, this is from the top of the grain elevator and looking across uh, to give you a perspective, there's the clock tower in the middle. Uh, this area, of course, is uh, uh, now a modern office. Well, firstly, uh, this area is a, is a bit open, and there are modern office blocks over here, and the Nelson Mandela Gateway is here. Um, just to also show you one of the roles that Cape Town played, uh, these two vessels here are whalers. In other words, these were the vessels that went with a bigger ship to harpoon the whales, to catch them and kill them, and then tow them to the bigger ship where they were cut up and processed into whale oil, whale meat and bone meal and whatever else. Um, and these ships went down to the Southern Ocean uh, for their whaling. And many of them stayed in Cape Town. The whaling fleets actually came from either Holland, uh, Holland or Germany, Russia or Britain. And uh, these whaling fleets made an annual pilgrimage to Cape Town where the mothership would take on fuel. And remember the mothership had to have fuel for all these catches. They might have had uh, 15 or 20 catches operating. Um, they take on fuel and food and everything else and also employed South Africans to be laborers on board. It was a terrible job because uh, they had to be knee-deep in whale gore for about two months, terrible smell, and of course, 
the cold and, and so on uh, was a problem as well that they had to cope with. But that's what happened. And there was also whaling off the South African coast. And it was centered at Donkaghat, which is in uh, Soldana Bay, just at the entrance to Soldana Bay, and in Durban. And there were whaling activities elsewhere, like Simonstown and Betty's Bay and Plettenberg Bay and Hermanus and so on. But um, the, the whale catchers operated mainly out of Soldana Bay, uh, from Donkaghat, or from Durban. Um, the... To give you a perspective as well, uh, the waterfront has developed over there. Those two buildings are still standing. They're part of the waterfront shopping complexes. Uh, this building is still standing. The swing bridge goes across here. Um, and uh, all sorts of other buildings as well have been uh, put up here. And Table Bay Hotel is over there. Uh, that's one of the Union Castle intermediate steamers. Uh, they had the mail ships that ran a very tight schedule between Cape Town and between South Africa and Southampton. But the intermediates would uh, go clockwise or anti-clockwise around Africa. A fantastic voyage going through Suez, um, northward in one, uh, some ships went northward through Suez and some ships came southward through Suez. But a wonderful, wonderful trip. Um, here are the tugs for Cape Town. And uh, uh, there, this, there's still the tug berth, and you may see them moving around from here to go and work ships. The tugs don't look like that anymore, though. Um, there were all sorts of uh, interesting buildings here. Um, one building, I think it was that one there, was a fish market. And um, I, I remember as a kid, it was still there. And um, we would go and buy the fish from there on a Saturday afternoon and take it home, and Mama would cook it. But that is uh, what Cape Town Harbour looked like in the 1930s. Um, here's the mail ship departure. Uh, we saw a mail ship arrival, this massive crowd on the wharf, uh, the gangway just being removed, uh, lots of people on, uh, on the ship here uh, ready to go. And uh, there she goes, four funneler sailing from Cape Town with a tug pushing the bow around. Uh, this picture was probably taken in the early 1920s. This ship came out in 1921, so it was after that. And uh, there she goes. And remember, this was a huge, huge ship of the day uh, with four funnels, and she looked very grand. Uh, this is an old picture in the Alfred Basin. Alfred Basin, uh, and just again to put it in perspective, this would have been taken almost from the front door of the uh, Cape Grace Hotel, looking across. Now we've got a big office block uh, that is in uh, office blocks that are at the backdrop to this. That building is still there. Uh, the rest has been modified quite a lot. These are the old Irvin and Johnson trawlers. Uh, they were designed for the North Sea, and hence you'll find many pictures of old British trawlers that looked exactly the same as this. These were built in Britain, designed for the North Sea, but brought out here to fish for Irvin and Johnson. Um, this picture is interesting. Firstly, this vessel in the foreground was one of the old Thiessen coasters. And uh, Thiessens, who uh, came here from Norway in 1869, they came to South Africa by accident. They didn't really want to come here. They were bound for New Zealand in a small schooner called the Albatross. The Albatross suffered damage off the Cape, and she put into Neisner. And so at Neisner, you will find that there were uh, some industries there set up by the Thiessen family because they stayed. They liked it so much. And uh, they traded from Neisner to Cape Town in the Albatross. They took um, timber. They took all sorts of things from Neisner. And of course, they brought all sorts of things and passengers back to Neisner, and they put up a roaring trade. But Thiessen is probably better known for its trade along the West Coast, from Cape Town up to Port Nolleth, to Ludritz, and to Wolfers Bay. And sometimes they would call it Lambert's Bay and places like that, these small vessels getting into these small ports. But what is also interesting about this particular picture is behind this, uh, the building behind, just getting my cursor that seems to wander all over the show. Um, this building behind is the uh, Victorian Alfred Hotel. 
And um, it is shown here, and this picture was probably taken around about 1930. Um, it's shown here uh, with three stories. Now, this was a cargo shed, and it had various floors and all sorts of uh, storage facility inside. But it was burnt down. And when it was rebuilt, it was rebuilt as a two-story building. And it served Irvin and Johnson trawling fleet, which took over the Alfred Basin for several years. Um, it, it, it served as a storage facility for Irvin and Johnson for their nets and their other equipment. And uh, this, this cursor seems to wander. There it is. Um, and so it was rebuilt as a two-story building. But when that whole lot was converted into that very nice hotel that is now the V&A Hotel, they put the third story back. And so you will see pictures taken in the 40s and 50s and 60s and so on with this building, a two-story building, but it reverted to three stories, and that is the hotel today. And this is the, uh, the, the bit of the waterfront, and this is the Alfred Basin. That's another of the little coasters that went up to Port Nolith over there. Um, well, we've gone the wrong way, I think. Uh, there we go. And then we had another side to the fishing industry. This was, these are all the snook boats. You can see the seats along there for the hand lines, uh, guys working the hand lines to catch the snook. Uh, these were snook boats. And this is Roja Bay. Now, if you transpose this onto a map of Cape Town today, it's probably where uh, uh, the Roja Bay post office is. And that is uh, somewhere around about that tall building that's now called Tybalt Square. It used to be called uh, BP Center. And I think it's got an LG on the top, but that's about where that was. And of course, a huge reclamation project took place during the 1930s, like this. This is the, uh, cursor, wait, there. Uh, this is the, the old harbor here. The original harbor is this area here. Uh, then we built out the Victoria Basin. Uh, we saw the mail ship departure there or the mail ship arrival there. This is the Collier Jetty where the grain elevator is about there and grain exports from there. And that was the main entrance to the harbor. But the ships were getting bigger. Uh, Union Castle, for example, announced plans to have some, what for the time, were pretty enormous ships, uh, 215 meters. Um, and there were two Italian ships as well that ran to South Africa, and they were also quite long. And so the port was getting too small for, the, uh, for its hinterland, and so they built this section. And this section was built on in the early 1930s, and it was later extended along that dotted line. This random mole thing here was just built to shelter the vessels. But this is where the mail ships, for example, uh, came in over there and there. And you may also uh, remember that picture that I've just shown you that uh, the Roja Bay area was around here. So the fishing harbor, uh, big part, fishing harbor was here and over here. And in some cases, the fishing boats were just pulled up onto the beach and the, the fishermen sold their catch to the local fish uh, vendors who would hawk it around Cape Town, blowing those old fish horns. There's a photo of that. Uh, the reclamation has uh, continued apace since that map was drawn. Uh, there's that random mole that I showed you. And uh, it's been partly demolished because the new Duncan Dock, as we called it, was being extended along here. But this whole area was being filled in. That Roja Bay fishing harbor was lost in the process. It was about there. There's the old Dock Road power station. And uh, also to give you perspective, there's the castle. Uh, the castle is over there. Uh, so this was filled in and uh, became our foreshore area. And you'll see the dredges working here. They drew up mud from here and got dumped there. Uh, they brought every piece of rubble they could find to fill in this huge gap. This was, of course, still the harbor, uh, still the main harbor. This was the old harbor here, the Alfred Basin. 
um, those fishing trawlers would have been in there, the coaster thing over here, um, and so on, and the Table Bay Hotel in this area here. So life had got a bit easier for the pilots they had to bring ships into the confines of the harbor because there's one of those Union Castle mail ships at Aberth, which became a very uh, tender spot for South Africans and particularly Cape Townians as they saw the mail ships off. And of course, on board those mail ships would have been their loved ones going to England. Here's the other mail ship just in uh, from the UK. Um, here's the other one. Uh, that was one of the, you saw that four funnel vessel. Well, they changed them and modified them in 1937 and they brought them back into service with only two funnels. And there is one of, there were two of them and there's one of them there. And there's one of those big Italian vessels that I was speaking about there. So this was Cape Town Harbor in the 1930s with all this extension happening. And this photo just to put it in perspective, the, that photo taken from here, looking this way, and just note that white ship there, because she appears in this picture. There she is, there's that white picture. We're standing here, this berth isn't yet finalized, they haven't got the tarmac done yet, and there they are. There's that Italian vessel, there's Warwick Castle, which was one of the Union Castle mail ships, and this is a cruise ship called the Empress of Britain. Normally, she would run across the North Atlantic from Liverpool or Southampton to Canadian ports. Uh, but in the winter, it was too rough. And so uh, nobody in their right mind would want to travel across the North Atlantic in winter. So in the Northern Hemisphere winter, she went cruising. And here she is in Cape Town. She made two calls in Cape Town. Her first call um, proved a bit of a disaster, and a minor disaster. She, they birthed her here. And when it was time to leave, the Southeaster came up and pinned her against the wall for about two days, and they couldn't get her away. So uh, they learned and they birthed her here the next time she came. Now, this picture was taken in 1939. Um, within a couple of years, all of these ships were at the bottom of the sea. Uh, the Italian ship, the Italian ship here, was sunk by British bombers in, off the coast of Italy. Warwick Castle was sunk, uh, I think, off the coast of Portugal. Um, and Empress of Britain was attacked by bombers and set on fire. And then she was sunk by a submarine uh, a day or two later. Uh, the biggest British wartime loss. Um, so all three of these ships were lost in the war that would follow. And there's the war in the Alfred Basin. You will see that here we've now only got a two-story building because the fire had come and taken off the top floor and uh, they rebuilt it as a two-story building. But these are local trawlers and whalers. Those are whalers, these look like trawlers. And uh, they were converted to minesweepers and patrol vessels. They uh, uh, put where the, uh, the, the whalers, where the harpoon gun had been, they put a gun that meant business for ships and they gave them mine sweep, sweeping equipment. And here they are in the Alfred Basin, uh, all painted gray and ready for action. You'll see the mine sweeping gear, uh, Derek's over here, but there's that two story building in the background that's now three stories and is the hotel called the Victoria and Alfred. This is taken from the grain elevator during the war. And you'll see a British battleship here. You'll see troop ships here. That's one of the Union Castle ships serving as a troop ship. That's an Orient Line vessel serving as troop ship. Another Orient Line vessel, uh, a Donaldson Line vessel. And then you'll see all the ships outside here. Um, convoys of up to 30 ships would arrive. And at times there were 40 ships at anchor. And the interesting part is that uh, when uh, after the war, when Germans and Brits were comparing notes, um, people asked some of the German submarine uh, captains, commanders, uh, why they didn't attack these ships. And uh, one of them said, because nobody told us that they were there. But of course, in 1942, there was a huge submarine onslaught on shipping off the Cape. And uh, altogether, um, with uh, submarine um, successes 
and uh, ships lost because they hit mines or sunk by that uh, one and only uh, German battleship to come this way, the Kraft Spee. Um, a total of 152 ships were lost off the Cape during, uh, off South Africa rather, during World War II. Uh, and this gives you an idea of what the anchorage looked like and Durban anchorage looked the same. Queen Mary came here. This is the old Queen Mary, of course. She came here carrying Australian troops bound for Europe. And here she is in Table Bay. And um, uh, Admiral Dönitz of the uh, high uh, German Navy High Command had uh, put a really high price to any U-boat commander who could take one of these big ships, the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth or Aquitania out. And of course they tried. Um, there was one successful submarine commander who survived the war and they asked him if he'd ever come across one of these. And he said, yeah, I did, but I lost her in the rain. And so he would have probably got a farm in Main Street of Berlin if he'd managed to sink that because these things were carrying 10,000 troops. And you can imagine the huge loss that would have been and the morale dashing blow that a loss of one of these ships would have been. So there she is off Cape Town. She was too big to get into Cape Town. So they took water and all sorts of supplies and things out to her in the bay. Uh, that's Duncan Dock uh, after the war, 1946. Just note the red square here. This is the original harbor, Victoria Basin growing from that. And then the Duncan Dock built here named after the Governor General of uh, South Africa at the time, Sir Patrick Duncan. Uh, we had a Sturrock dry dock, which uh, was built, it, it's a, it's remains the longest dry dock in the Southern Hemisphere and, uh, and the, the biggest dry dock in Africa. Durban is just a little bit smaller, uh, but it was built with the ships of the time in mind those big British battleships, the aircraft carriers and so on. Uh, even the Queen Elizabeth could have got in there. But uh, unfortunately, it's too narrow for modern tankers and bulk carriers that have a, a beam or a width of uh, 60 or 70 meters. So that is the harbor as it was at the end of the war. This, the completion of the harbor was speeded up because of the war. Uh, the random mole that you saw was about here. The old Cape Town Pier was about there, and uh, but this lot was uh, built up, and over here uh, the foreshore area was filled in, and then the eastern mole built over there. So that's Cape Town Harbour in 1946. Uh, this is that dry dock, um, and this picture was taken probably in 1947. I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, this picture was taken about 1947. These two ships are own, were owned by the South African Railways and Harbours, and they had interesting times because these ships carried mainly coal or manganese or something outward to places like India or to in, uh, what is now Indonesia and so on. And then they would go to Australia to a little port called Bunbury, and they would load Jara sleepers for the railways. Railways were expanding, of course. And the South African railways operated a fleet of about five ships before the war. And after, after the war, that was narrowed down to three. But as the railway sleepers were needed in such great quantities, because railway expansion was just about at an end, um, these ships were put to other use. And the one use was to bring coal from Lorenzo Markish, that's a modern day Maputo, to Cape Town and to Port Elizabeth and even to Walfus Bay for the power stations, for the, um, uh, the coal fired ships, for domestic use, for industry, and of course for the steam engines that were all over the show. But if you go to this place now, you would hardly recognize it because all around here on both sides, over here, round there, round there, etc., there are huge sheds uh, in which uh, workshops uh, operate to work on parts for the ships, uh, paint stores, engineering works, you name it, they're all around here. Mainly industries focused on the ship repair industry. And of course, with a dry dock like this, uh, we get a lot of clients using that dry dock. It's just a pity that it's so narrow and you'll see uh, later on uh, what a plan is for Cape Town. 
So we trundled along and everything got back to normal after the war. And then lo and behold, 1956, the Suez Canal closed. And the ships came around here in their hundreds. And again, we had queues outside mainly Cape Town and Durban of 40 ships. And of course, the big passenger ships that normally didn't come here, like this one here, the Arcadia, sorry, Iberia of uh, P&O, or the Uganda of uh, British India, and a host of cargo ships. Uh, this is one that normally traded between Britain and uh, India and Pakistan. Um, a host of these ships uh, came around the Cape. Very interesting time for people like me who ship mad. And, uh, but it was also a fantastic boom for Cape Town and for Durban because all of these ships needed supplies. When they came here, they needed fuel, they needed fresh water. Uh, if they were passenger ships, the passengers went ashore. So there was huge opportunity to make money out of this. And of course the ports did well as well because every single berth was taken. And it was a case of uh, when one ship sailed, the next one came directly in to refuel or to take on stores or whatever. So it was a huge time of congestion for the local ports but it was an absolute windfall for all those ancillary industries around the harbor. A picture taken also from the top of the grain elevator. There's the, in centerpiece is the uh, Dock Road power station. Uh, there's still some surviving buildings, like that building is still around. Um, some of these have, have gone, but here's an old steam engine trundling along. Um, here's the road, and this is uh, used to be a big traffic circle here. It's now a robot, and the entrance to the waterfront is over here. And uh, this is the grain elevator, and there are more buildings being built around here. And of course, that is the railway line that was uh, used by the trains going to uh, load um, coal, uh, grain rather, grain, um, or bringing grain in the days when we were exporting grain. But that's a lovely old picture from the top of the grain elevator. And here's a train that we don't see anymore, this lovely old steam engine um, called Amanda. And uh, these guys really uh, looked after these steam engines and hopefully Amanda at home received similar attention. But this is a coal train. And uh, this train would have been loaded with coal from one of those ships coming in from Lorenzo Marx and uh, would have been taken off to the power stations. Um, I, I sent this picture to a, a railway expert and he looked at the trucks here and he said, well, those aren't used for mainline uh, railway service. They would have been local ones. So he suggested that this train would be going to the old Pardon Island power station or to even Athlone power station or somewhere like that. Uh, but there they are. There were lots of these. And of course, they caused a lot of problem because they shunted these things across the, the roads. And you can imagine a ship's agent rushing to a ship coming in or a ship sailing and having to wait uh, while these trains were shunted around the place. We had, um, just going back, uh, Cape Town is a major export for fruit from the deciduous fruit areas of uh, Elgin and around there and the uh, series and so on. And of course, grapes uh, and citrus from the, uh, Orin, uh, from the Olifants River Valley and also fruit from the Orange River Valley. Now, Cape Town had a huge um, uh, fruit processing, uh, not processing, a pre-cooling store. What used to happen is that trains would bring the fruit in refrigerated trucks down to the harbor from Elgin, from um, Stellenbosch, from Paul, from Worcester, from uh, the Duins, from uh, the sidings near to Clan William and Citrusdal. Those places don't have railways, but the sidings there. And those trains would bring the fruit down. And they would, the fruit would be put into a pre-cooling store, which would keep it at a particular temperature and would hold it at that temperature until the ship arrived. When the ship arrived, the ship had holes, that's the place where you keep cargo, the ship had holes that could be cooled to that temperature. And so the holes would be cooled. And then the fruit was taken out of the store and put into the ships and taken mainly in that time to Europe or to Britain. 
That store burned down. And there's the fire. Now, um, just again to give you perspective, Cape Town Central is over that area. Um, and um, the old mail ship berth is over here off picture to the left. And the Victoria Basin is in the right foreground. Now, this store burned down. This is taken the day after. It was a massive fire. You can see the steel is buckled. Uh, it's still smoldering there. And this whole pre-cooling store burned down. Not only that, this gantry here served ships berthed here in the Victoria Basin. And the fruit would be taken from the pre-cooling store, pushed along here on trolleys, and then loaded into ships here. And so when this was burning, when this uh, pre-cooling store was burning, um, somebody forgot to close the fire doors and a ball of flame apparently just shot through this uh, gantry and set fire to this part as well. So in the space of a few hours, we had lost our fruit export capacity. There was nothing left, nothing, nothing, nothing left. Now, that was in January 1958, and that is the height of our fruit season. Grapes are going out then. Some deciduous fruit and so on are being exported at the time. So be busy, 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 full of fruit. Well, unfortunately, it all got cooked. And there we have the devastation. But I must tell you that one year later, January 1959, the new pre-cooling store was open. In other words, they got rid of all this, uh, this rubble here. They'd removed this gantry. And they'd repaired this, and we had now a brand new pre-cooling store that actually extended further than this one. It was bigger and, of course, more efficient. So this was a, a, a huge tragedy, and the people then had to make all sorts of arrangements to, to keep this uh, fruit at the required temperature before it was shipped. But within a year, the whole thing was rebuilt. Imagine how long it would take today. We had cruise ships visiting. This was Caronia. Uh, she always attracted hundreds and hundreds of visitors. She was light green in color. Um, and although she was smaller than, than the biggest Union castle ships at the time, uh, she really made an impression when she arrived on her biannual cruise, loaded with rich Americans. And of course, a vessel like this brought millions of pounds in those days to Cape Town. But I want you to look at the foreground. The buildings in the foreground are the remnant of old buildings that were built during World War II as part of the protection of Cape Town Harbor. Uh, these were the barracks for the chaps who man, manned the guns. This, is, this used to have a rudimentary radar tower on top. That was like a lookout thing and a radar station. There were guns across here. And also off here uh, were the bollards that held in place the submarine net across the entrance to the harbor. The people here were gunning, were, were gunners, and there were also people who maintained this uh, net. Uh, a small launch would go out and uh, they would release it, then she'd put it aside. The tugs, these were the old steam tugs. I used to ride around on them, uh, magnificent to, to get on board. The tug masters were so friendly. There's the Alfred Basin, uh, just looking across here. Uh, this would be where the Ned Bank building is. The um, Cape Grace Hotel is here. One and only is over there. The aquarium's over here. Uh, this is now the, uh, now been flooded and is the yacht marina and, um, and so on. Um, I won't tell you a story about that ship, but uh, we'll move on. We built a tanker basin over here, uh, there. And uh, this, of course, is the original harbor down there. Uh, just to tell you something about uh, the Elements, you're going to have, uh, some of you may be going to have uh, dinner at Element House. Well, that's one of Sir John Elements' freighters. She looks a bit worse for wear, but I can tell you what, he ran an excellent shipping company. Um, and uh, he also ran four passenger ships that looked like this. They were the epitome of luxury and really beautiful, beautiful ships. 
Uh, this is the 1967-1975 uh, Suez closure. These are all Australia-bound immigrant ships. Um, the size of ships changed. This uh, vessel was the first tanker to carry over 300,000 tons of crude oil. Uh, she's uh, 300 and something meters long. That's three times rugby field size. And these ships started coming around the Cape because of that Suez closure. And of course, Union Castle was important. Uh, there was the office in Adley Street. Uh, Union Castle had masses of public relations uh, uh, George, uh, this is a berth just before sailing, all the visitors going off. Look how they dressed in those days. They were actually allowed next to the ship and even on the ship. And everybody got off having had tea with their friends or relatives who were sailing on the ship. And there she goes, loaded with people. Uh, the last people, last cargo on were the, some of the passengers taking their cars with them to drive around the UK or, or Europe and then bring the car back. This is the mail. Um, that's why they were called the mail ships. They had to be in port and the first bag of mail, it was a contract, the first bag of mail had to be on the quayside at six o'clock on a Thursday morning. That's the mail from the UK. And um, it happened like clockwork. The ships arrived at five o'clock, took the pilot, came alongside, the hatches were opened and the mail was the first off. And there we have the mail from Great Britain. Um, and just to give you a little example, I lived in Mowbray as a kid and went to school in Pinelands, um, a distance of about five kilometers, I suppose. Used to pedal my bicycle down there when I was in standard five or grade uh, seven, as it's now called. Uh, but when I pedaled back home on a Thursday afternoon at three o'clock, my comic called Tiger, my mother's Women's Weekly and my brother's Hobbies Weekly were in our letterbox. And that, that lot had been landed that morning in the docks. Somehow they got it to our house that afternoon. Now we can't do, do it in months. Uh, but lo and behold, that is how good that mail system was. And before computers, and probably that's why it was so good. There's the mail ship sailing, crowds of people. Uh, the last sailing of the mail ships, um, this was the last passenger mail ship, the S.A. Val, to sail in September uh, 1977. And then the last mail bag to be carried on a Union Castle ship being loaded on the 10th of October, 11th of October, 1977. That was one of the cargo mail ships. And you'll see the containers on the foredeck here. And unfortunately, a combination of containers and air travel killed the Union Castle service. But there's the last mail bag being loaded ceremoniously into the sling to be loaded on board. All gone. We now have where the mail ships used to sail from over here. We now have a repair key. The old cargo shed and passenger shed have gone. The container terminal has been built up there. And uh, we have some strange visitors like this one, which is the biggest floating structure ever to have entered Cape Town. It's a floating storage oil uh, storage and offtake vessel. It processes um, oil from below the seabed. It takes out mud and uh, sulfur and water. And then the rest is taken ashore by an ordinary tanker to be processed. There she is being towed to Angola. And there are the old scenes of cargo and cargo and more cargo. Imagine how many of these things were damaged in the process. There's more cargo. Look at all the workers there. Um, and then we built the container terminal because things were changing. There's the original harbor in that red square. There's the container terminal in its embryonic state. And we got these big container ships coming. Um, now they're over 300 meters long, carrying up to eight or 10,000 containers. Uh, we had these Roro ships uh, with this massive ramp at the, at the stern uh, where the cargo was simply trucked on and trucked off. Um, but then we also had these uh, newfangled uh, container cranes that are among the most modern in the world. And from four small ones, we now have eight big ones that can um, load any of the big container ships. 
And uh, so we have a repair facility. Won't go into the details of that ship repair. You'll have to come next time to hear about it. But that was an amazing operation. There she is in that Sturrock dry dock. You see, she just fits in. Uh, we did a lot of rig repairs in the days when the oil um, industry was at its height. Uh, sadly, it fell away um, a few years ago, and we haven't seen a rig for perhaps uh, 10 years. Um, there's that uh, area that once held oil tanks and petrol tanks, and uh, it's now flooded to form that yacht marina with those fancy flats around it. And we now get the cruise ships coming. Uh, well, we used to get the cruise ships before the COVID. And there's Queen Mary, the new Queen Mary, uh, leaving Cape Town on her first voyage. Uh, we have the MSC ships coming in and Cape Town in the background looking beautiful. Um, and then just a, a thought. We have about 29,000 ships rounding the Cape each year. Egypt built a new canal in one year. They had the old Suez Canal, and in one year, they built a 92-kilometer new canal parallel to the old one. With all our engineering expertise and experience, why can't we build a large dry dock? We need one. We've got these huge, huge ships passing here. Um, one of them one day is going to need urgent dry docking. But we could be making a fortune out of it. We could be employing thousands of people in a, in a major ship repair industry if we had a large dry dock, either a dugout one or a floating one, but we need it. And that's all. Oh, Brian, that was phenomenal. Thank you so, so much. What a great voyage. Um, quite poignant, thinking about the submarines and your family. Um, I'm so, so glad and can't wait for your book next, next March. Um, all 288 pages, uh, hardcover, uh, and about 750 illustrations that you're self-publishing. Um, please, if anybody wants that book, contact me or, or Brian, brian at cakeports.coza. It'd be lovely to have some questions. Craig, I don't know whether you want to say anything from the yes, comments. Yes, there was a question from Gabby, who, um, thank you, Gabby, for your question. Gabby asked, what were those two tall towers in the previous photo? That was the photo previous to the coal train with the lovely old steam locomotive. So if you can scroll back. Let's have a look. To the train. Then it was the one before the train. Must be quite soon now. So many wonderful old photographs. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that one. Oh, that, that's the power station. Yeah, that, that's Dock Road Power Station. Um, it started out having just one chimney, and then they built a second chimney in about 1940-something. But uh, the power station was closed down in the 60s. Obviously, uh, you can't have a power station like that in the middle of a city center. But it was actually amazing because the coal used to be brought from the ships, which are at a berth off to the left. And uh, the coal would be brought around here and up there all the way and, uh, and into a, a, a coal bunker over here and then taken into the power station. Another building that's still around is this one. It's the old Imperial Coal Storage Building. It's still there. It was a SEAF office. I don't know what it is now. Um, and uh, the, the shell has been retained. But that and that were um, uh, the actual places where they stored frozen fish um, and uh, to be taken up by train or truck later on. Um, so it was, uh, it was lovely. It really was. Uh, this is the old... Uh, the slipway has been changed. It's now a synchro lift, but it's still there in a much more modern format. Um, and as you come into the waterfront area, you sometimes see vessels up here, smaller vessels being uh, painted and whatever over here. Great. And then another comment or question to clarify something from Tilford. 
who wrote, there's a tall white structure in the harbor near the Table Bay Hotel, might be a crane with a Krupp logo on it. Um, no, do you that, know what that's that is? a floating crane. Um, the pictures that I've shown show an older crane, the, its predecessor that was built in 1924, and that one was built in the late 1970s um, as a replacement. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a floating crane and it is used to discharge heavy lift cargoes from some ships that, can't, that don't have cranes on board to lift off those cargoes. Um, unfortunately, it got into a bit of disrepair and uh, I'm not sure whether it's even operating at the moment. Hmm. And then another question from Peter Cullum, who asked one last question, how did the foreshore get filled in? Quite a big question. <laughs> uh, let's go to the picture and then... Um, yeah, um, the, the, this harbour had to be dredged. Uh, it was a, fortunately, it was mainly a sandy bottom. And so there's one and there's one and there's one. They're dredges. In other words, they suck up or they have buckets that go around and lift up the mud. And then they come in here and they would drop it. And of course, when that got too shallow for them, they would pump it ashore um, and just fill up. But every single bit of rubble of Cape Town would be brought in here. They also brought some from quarries uh, elsewhere around the city, uh, but it was filled in. And as I say, during World War II, this thing was uh, hastened to completion right along here um, the yacht club at the moment is over here, um, and so on. But there's Woodstock. Uh, sorry, that's not Woodstock. Uh, Woodstock Beach, as I know it, uh, knew it as a kid, is off to the uh, the left of the picture, and uh, people used to launch little boats from there or swim, if you like the cold Table Bay water. But uh, there's the pier, Cape Town's pier. It was demolished in 1938. Uh, that was their waterfront. And on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, there would be bands playing and people would walk up and down here, watch the yachts. But of course, that was um, destroyed when they filled in this area. Um, the uh, Naspers building, for example, is probably about here uh, at the moment. And the right. raised freeway comes skirting around here. And a question linked directly to that from Gabby is, did the pier link to the Herrenkracht Road? The pier, yeah. Yeah, well, Herrenkracht Road wasn't there. Uh, Herrenkracht uh, Road was built there, and it linked to Adley Street. And there's um, the mutual building, I think it is, or maybe that's, a, that's probably the mutual building there. Um, and uh, it was linked to Adley Street, and the Herrenkracht only was built after this was filled in. Very interesting. Then another question. I actually was thinking about this myself. I was thinking in the age of um, focusing a lot on artisanal small producers of produce, I was just thinking to myself, how wonderful if we could have a fish market for the public. And then I saw that photograph where you mentioned the fish market. Lila asked the question, was there more than one fish market? A big building on Dock Road but you mentioned the fish market near the clock tower. I don't know, but uh, I think there, there, there must have been a fish market on Dock Road because that was the fishing harbour. And if we, if we locate it, there's Dock Road, there's the power station with only one chimney. Um, Rocha Bay was here. That was the picture of the fishing harbour that I showed you with those snook boats. That was there. And so I would think that there would have been a fish market. I can't remember one myself. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But um, certainly I'm pretty sure there would have been a fish market. But the fish market I remember was one of these buildings down here. Uh, and on a Saturday, we would go and buy fish and mama would fry it in the evening. Thanks for the question from Peter who asked, Brian, what do you think? Um, is the future of Cape Town Harbour? I think it's quite good. Um, the container terminal is, is uh, quite busy. Uh, it's sort of the main focus now of the cargo. And of course, that were the, the, 
the construction of the container terminal and the whole containerization of cargo meant that the areas here that used to be full of cargo ships offloading cargo uh, could be converted to something else. And so the waterfront area developed. Uh, it was an in, absolutely ingenious uh, piece of work that. Um, and the area along there is now fishing. Uh, I and J have got South Arm 1 and South Arm 2. Viking fishing are here. Some other fishing is here. Another fishing is there. Atlantic trawling is here. And this has become the area for uh, the Antarctic um, base for South Africa. Um, so it, it's no longer needed for, for cargo work. Um, and so it's turned over for fishing. Remember, that's where I and J were in there. That was their uh, hub of operation. Um, but now they've moved to South Arm 1 and South Arm 2. Um, and uh, so there's no need for these cargo, but that's a cargo ship there. And that looks like an aircraft carrier, a small aircraft carrier, actually. Um, but um, these berths uh, are used for cargo now, uh, not for passengers. We don't have passenger ships except the cruise ships coming in here. Um, but the container terminal is taken over as the fulcrum of cargo in the harbor and therefore other areas of the harbor like the area around the waterfront could be turned over for tourism and the rest for fishing etc hmm. but i think the future of the harbor is good uh, so the container terminal is busy we do need an extra berth or two there um, unfortunately um, a plan to build seaward got stymied um, I think quite ridiculously, um, but that plan should have gone ahead and we should have had another four berths for container ships. That's why sometimes you see long queues of container ships outside the harbour. Ronnie asked if you could please tell us something more about your forthcoming book. Yeah, <laughs> um, you'll see some of these pictures in the book, but they're uh, between seven and 800 pictures. Um, there's 288 pages, and uh, it's going to be the same size as the other books on the Union Castle mail ships and so on. And um, it hopefully will be out in late February next year. We'd hoped to bring it out this year, but um, COVID messed up everything, and so it got put on hold. I didn't get put on hold. I managed to finish it. And, and now, it's, as we speak, it's uh, with a designer and it'll go to print um, in January next year. I will be doing an event. Brian's kindly agreed. And we hope to actually go on a launch, a boat, <laughs> go, go to the harbour um, and also do a talk related, a tour related by Dr. Lisa Keane about the freeways so so watch watch this space and i think we should finish there unless there are any burning questions um, those of you who are passionate about architecture on thursday at 5 30 professor arthur barker is talking about um harvard fagan and then next thursday talking about Piers Paul, who um, was a local architect but trained at the Bauhaus. And it's just fantastic. We're doing actual real person tours now. Um, had a great run at the Mount Nelson while it's temporarily closed. So we've been enjoying your work, Brian, <laughs> there. And um, Leslie Cox is doing a walking tour in town. And as Brian mentioned, we've got a little dinner at Element House coming up in November. But please let me know if you've got any suggestions, both for the online and the real person um, tours. Um, and again, Brian, phenomenal. Oh, you've, you've just um, enlightened us. I can't, I, I won't go to the waterfront again without thinking of you, whether it's thinking of the yeah. whales or the submarines, <laughs> um, the fish market. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. And I'm sure um, everyone will be giving you sort of claps. <laughs> um, and and I, I'm particularly touched because you hated the thought of doing a Zoom. And I, I'm with you. And I remember when the restrictions were lifted slightly, you said, oh, can't we do a real thing? We can, we can actually meet. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of you doing this Zoom, the first time you've done it, and then doing WeTransfer the first time. Um, absolutely fantastic. 
Um, and, I, and I hope you'll be doing some more online so people like Rodney and Peter around the world um, can enjoy it and, and, and we can ship their book, your book, to them. Um, so enjoy the designing and the final stages of, of your book. And also it's fantastic to hear about your continuing work at Law Hill, which is doing brilliant education work for young seamen, um, particularly black, talented individuals who otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity. Um, so I, I'm going I'm to finish here. Please feel free to email me and I can forward them to Brian. Uh, once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Brilliant. thank you.